Today, we're very fortunate to kick off our seminar series with Dr. Joe Borofsky. He received his doctorate in physics in 1981 from the University of Iowa. From 1982 to 2012, he was a staff member at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Now he's a senior research scientist at the Space Science Institute, where he's also the chair of the Center for Space Plasma Physics. His experience is in theoretical, computational, and experimental physics. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and his research interests focus on the structure of the solar wind, the system science of the Earth's magnetosphere, which is what we're going to hear about today, and the coupling between the solar wind and the magnetosphere. So with that, I turn it over to him. Good, well, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak, and I hope everybody's doing well out there. Um, I want to give a kind of a simple review of the magnetosphere, overview of the magnetosphere, kind of from a system science point of view. So it'll be a little different than you, you've seen before, I think. And this is um, material from an open access review paper that Juan Valdivia and I wrote, and it's uh, in blue here on the first page of the, of the slides, uh, and it's available and from surveys of geophysics. So we want to envision the magnetosphere as a system of interacting particle populations. So we'll look at some of the system properties of the magnetosphere in this talk, and we'll look at some system tools. So let's move on to slide two. So here's a sketch of the Earth's magnetosphere in pink here with the sun off to the left. So the, Earth's, uh, the Earth has a strong magnetic dipole, and there's a supersonic plasma wind coming from the from the sun left to right here and for that ionized plasma wind the dipole is impenetrable so the solar wind has to go around the earth's dipole so it forms a bow shock because it's supersonic the bow shock slows down and deflects the plasma around the magnetospheric system here and the perturbations of the magnetosphere are from the solar wind are on the outer portions of the magnetosphere where the magnetic field is weak, the magnetic field strength falling roughly as one over r cubed. And what the solar wind does is it compresses the day side magnetosphere into something stronger than a dipole and it lays down a long magneto tail behind the earth. And uh, this is the kind of a sketch I like about the magnetic field of the magnetosphere because it points out that in the high plasma beta portions of the magneto tail the magnetic field is very irregular. It has fluctuations with correlation scales of one or two Earth radii and they're strong fluctuations. So if you were to trace field lines back there, they look pretty goofy. Okay, let's move on to slide three. So the solar wind drives the magnetosphere and that's very important to the evolution of the system. And reconnection is the dominant mechanism by which the solar wind drives the magnetosphere. So point number one here, on the day side of the magnetosphere, reconnection connects magnetically the magnetosphere to the solar wind. It opens those magnetic field lines and connects them out into the solar wind. The moving solar wind, which is huge and has a lot of momentum, drags the magnetic flux from the day side over into the magneto tail and it lays it down into the magneto tail. So you're getting a transfer of B squared over eight pi energy off the front of the Earth into the magneto tail, plus you're getting a lot of solar wind magnetic field really into that B squared over eight pi laid down into the magneto tail. So a second reconnection point occurs in the magneto tail that disconnects the solar wind and it allows the magnetic flux to move from the magneto tail back up towards the dipole, around the dipole into the day side, giving a nice convection pattern. So if we look from above the North Pole at this picture, um, that's the next slide, slide four. We're viewing this convection from above the North Pole of the Earth. Now the sun on this picture is off the top and the red arrows are the drift paths of plasma and magnetic field. And they're coming in the pink region. They're coming from the magneto tail at the bottom. They're flowing around the outer portions of the dipole and they flow into the day side magneto pause where they're caught up in reconnection again. Closer to the Earth, there's a different circulation pattern, and that's the green shading. And that's a region of the Earth where the 
plasma drift paths are closed and they circle around the earth and basically co-rotate with the earth. And that boundary between the open and the closed drift paths is very important for magnetospheric physics. Where the drift paths are closed, ionospheric outgassing builds up to a very high density cold plasma in that green region. And outside of the green region and the pink region, the cool plasmas are very low density. And so there's all kinds of different physics that occurs inside that boundary versus outside that boundary. Okay. So the bullets on the left point out some of the things that convection does. And convection has steady aspects and it has impulsive aspects, both being important. It transports plasma from the magneto tail through the dipole and up to the day side magnetopause. It sets up current systems. It, the plasma betas change, diamagnetisms change, charge separations occur in this, uh, in this convection pattern and that sets up current systems. And the convection drives all kinds of <clears throat> internal processes in the magnetosphere. It creates unstable particle distribution functions, which creates plasma waves. The plasma waves undergo wave particle interaction, so they energize some particle populations. They pitch angle scatter other particle populations into the atmosphere to lose them. And the convection also sets up ionospheric outflows of ions and electrons from the ionosphere into the magnetosphere. And then finally, the convection pattern exhausts the magnetospheric plasmas to the dayside magnetopause where they're lost into the solar wind. So let's go to slide five, please. And here's a look at some of the major plasmas in the magnetosphere. And this is a logarithm of temperature vertical plot versus a logarithm of number density horizontal plot. The dashed lines are equal pressure or equivalently equal energy density. So if we start at the bottom right at the purple down there, the purple box, this is the temperatures and density range of ionospheric ions and electrons. And, and basically the density varies very strongly with altitude and it varies from the night side to the day side. Okay. Uh, the next box up here, kind of this uh, peach colored box, is the plasma sphere ions and electrons. Inside that region of the magnetosphere where the plasma is co-rotating on closed drift paths, ionospheric outgassing builds up to form the plasma sphere. And the density of the plasma sphere varies with distance from the Earth. Close to the Earth, it's very dense. As you go outward, it falls off in density. The next box going upward is yellow is the solar wind ions, just for comparison. That's sort of the range at Earth that you see solar wind ion density and temperatures. And then from that yellow box upward and to the right, there's a dark gray box called magnetosheath ions. And that's the, basically the solar wind as it passes through the bow shock, it gets compressed in density and heated. And it's the magnetosheath that bathes the magnetosphere. The solar wind doesn't really contact the magnetosphere, it contacts it through the magnetosheath, which is the shocked solar wind, and has different properties than the, than the unshocked solar wind. To the left, the pink box is the warm plasma cloak ions, the density and temperature range that you see for those guys. And, and this, the plasma cloak is a very underappreciated plasma in the magnetosphere. We don't know much about it, but we're pretty certain it's important. So with this plasma cloak, there's a lot of research that's needed. We need statistical studies of the cloak. When does it occur? How density, temperature, and whatnot. We, ne we need to learn where it comes from. It's from the ionosphere, but there's arguments. Is it from the auroral zone ionosphere? Is it from the polar cap ionosphere? We don't know. We don't know its controlling factors. You know, when is it dense and why and that kind of stuff. And we also haven't really assessed the impacts that that plasma has on the full system. So there's a lot of work to be done on the warm plasma cloak. Uh, and uh, so if you're looking for a research topic, I think that's got a good future. Okay, so up from there, the purple box is the electron plasma sheet. And above that in blue is the ion plasma sheet. Uh, ion plasma sheet typically uh, higher temperature than the electron plasma sheet. And I like to separate those two particle populations out, especially when you get towards the dipole, because the electron plasma sheet goes one direction, 
in convection, and the ion plasma sheet goes another direction, and so they're not co-located all the time in the dipole. They're really different plasma populations. In the tail, they're co-located, but once you get in the dipole, that comes apart. So above that is two light blue box and a red box, substrum injected electrons and substrum injected ions. What these populations are is there are suprathermal electrons and ions in the magneto tail that normally don't get into the dipole because the gradient and curvature drift uh, sweeps them off to the side. And so when plasma convects into the dipole, the hotter particles from the tail don't make it into the dipole. It's only when you get a substorm injection, when you get a very strong earthward impulse of E cross B drift, that those energetic particles get delivered into the dipole. Uh, the, the E cross B drift beats the gradient curvature drift during those events, and, and that tail population is getting into the dipole, but only occasionally. And then finally, above those two, there is the electron radiation belt in dark red and the ion radiation belt in dark green. And the densities and temperatures that are quoted here are from geosynchronous orbit. Now we focus a lot on the electron radiation belt and I think that's because the mobility of electrons is very high and so the flux of energetic particles you get from the electron radiation belt is much greater than the flux you see from the ion radiation belt. But you'll notice that the ion radiation belt is denser than the electron radiation belt and it also has more energy density. So even though we don't pay much attention to it, it's there and it's big. Okay, let's move on to slide six, please. So let's envision the system. And uh, here's a definition of a complex system, these four points here. And when you go through the literature of system science, you find that the definition of a complex system varies from paper to paper, from textbook to textbook. It's not universal. There's some common threads. And this is just uh, one definition I'm quoting from one textbook. Uh, so the system has components that are not homogeneous. And we're just gonna ask, is this true of the magnetosphere? And the second point, it has components that have multi-level structure. And that means that the behavior of the components change as their environment changes. That there are complicated interactions between the components and some interactions are nonlinear. Okay, so we're gonna think of the Earth's magnetosphere and the subsystems or components that we're gonna think of are the diverse different particle populations. Now in the magnetosphere, the particle populations are co-located. They're on the same magnetic field lines. So it's very easy for those populations to interact with each other, especially via plasma waves. And we're gonna think about three regions of the magnetosphere and I'm gonna list them down here and I'm gonna talk about the particles that are overlapping in those regions. So the first region is the dipolar portion of the magnetosphere inside of that open closed drift trajectory boundary inside of the plasma pause and also inside of a drainage plume if you have one. And the particle populations, the major ones that you see there are the plasma sphere, PSP, the green box tells what these stand for, the electron radiation belt, the ion radiation belt, the ion plasma sheet, and of course, you're magnetically connected to the ionosphere. So all these particle populations you'll, you'll find on the same magnetic field line. A second major region of the magnetosphere is the dipolar region outside of that plasma pause, where the drift trajectories are open. And there, the plasma sheet is, the plasma sphere is gone, and you get the electron plasma sheet. Those are mutually exclusive geographic plasmas. Electron plasma sheet does not overlap with the plasma sphere. Okay. So in that second region, outside the plasma pause, you have the electron plasma sheet, electron radiation belt, ion radiation belt, ion plasma sheet, cloak, substrum injected electrons, and of course, the ionosphere is also on those field lines. So there's a lot of plasmas co-located in that region. And then a third region is the magneto tail where you have the ion plasma sheet and the electron plasma sheet. You have the mantle that's usually up in the lobes, but sometimes comes down into the plasma sheet. You have the low latitude boundary layer, and of course, again, you're magnetically connected to the ionosphere. 
So let's go to slide seven, please. So here's some examples of the interactions between particle populations and what the mechanism is and, and how it comes about. So let's look at the first line of this. The mechanism is Whistler chorus waves. Uh, those waves are driven by substorm injected electrons. That's where the free energy comes from to make unstable distribution functions. Those waves live in the electron plasma sheet. And those waves affect, among others, the electron radiation belt. It's the chorus waves that sort of cook the electron radiation belts up and make them hotter and hotter and hotter with time. A second coupling mechanism is electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves. <clears throat> That's driven by the ion plasma sheet, free energy of the ion plasma sheet. Those waves live in the plasma sphere and the plasma spheric plume. And those waves affect the electron radiation belt. They give you a pitch angle scattering of the radiation belt particles that precipitates them into the atmosphere and loses the radiation belt. Likewise, there's other ULF waves, is the next line here, uh, driven by the magneto sheath and by instabilities in the ion plasma sheet. It lives in the cloak and it lives in the ion plasma sheet and it affects both the electron and ion radiation belts. And, and I won't go through the other ones, but if you look in that, paper that I suggested on page one, that uh, Borofsky and Valdivia uh, review, it goes through, it has a chapter on various coupling mechanisms and it has a paragraph or two about each of these types of mechanisms plus others. Okay, so let's move on. Next slide, that one, good. So complicated interactions. So this is a sketch of interactions and plasma populations that directly impact the electron radiation belt. So these are connections to the radiation belt. And I'm not going to work through this uh, picture, but you can see it's pretty complicated. There's all kinds of different waves driven by different distributions, and those distributions are driven by other things and whatnot, and, uh, and they impact the evolution of the electron radiation belt. And this is just some of the stuff that acts on the radiation belt. And, and I want to pause here and, and, and say something. Um, over the last couple of decades, the radiation belt community has really done an amazing job at figuring out all of these connections and quantifying these connections. And there, there's still, of course, work to be done yet, but um, the radiation belt physics has gone a long way in the last couple of decades. And this is an example of you know, system aspects that affect the radiation belt. And I think it's safe to say that a lot of this work was spearheaded by Richard Thorne over the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, you know, encouraging people to study this, encouraging people to study that, working with people and, and really putting all of this complicated picture together. So a sketch like this is, is one part of the legacy of Richard Thorne. So I wanna focus in on just a little bit of this sketch. So let's go to the next slide. And I'm gonna look at those three red boxes. So we have substorm injected electrons. They drive chorus waves, which heat the radiation belt. The ion plasma sheet drives emic waves, which scatters the radiation belt and you lose the radiation belt. So I wanna quantify this and look at nonlinear interactions. So let's go to the next slide, which is gonna be based on those three boxes. So, if you look at, if you measure the radiation belt by the flux F in the tail of the, in the high energy tail of the radiation belt, then you can write down this first equation that the time rate of change of the flux is equal to the intensity of chorus waves. So if chorus waves get louder, get stronger, the rate of change of the flux will increase. And so if you time integrate both sides of that equation over to the right, you get that the flux depends on the time integral of the chorus wave intensity in the magnetosphere. The second equation, likewise, for emic, uh, the rate of change of the flux on the tail of the distribution is dependent on minus the emic intensity. The stronger the emic intensity, the more precipitation you have and the faster the flux decreases. 
So if you integrate the time integrate both sides of that equation, you get the thing on the right there that the flux of the radiation belt, electron radiation belt, is equal to minus the time integral of the emic wave intensity. Now we're going to proxy the chorus wave intensity with the flux of 130 kilovolt electrons, which is the flux of substorm injected electrons in the magnetosphere. And we're going to proxy the emic as the pressure of the ion plasma sheet or the energy density of the ion plasma sheet, which is the distribution that drives the emic waves. So you can write down that bottom equation with the wiggly equal sign that the flux of 1.2 MeV radiation belt electrons is equal to a time integral of the flux of 130 substorm injected electrons minus the time integral of the pressure or energy density of the ion plasma sheet. And you can um, match this up with data. We, so we've gone through 12 years of one hour measurements uh, and optimized the coefficients in that equation of the coefficient up front and the integration time. And, and that's what we get. It's the, about a two day integral of the substorm injected electrons minus about a half a day integral of the ion plasma sheet pressure. And when we look in the data, the left hand side versus the right hand side of that equation in the data, we get about an 82% correlation for like 93,000 hours of data. Now, if we tried to make algebraic correlations in, or algebraic correlations with time lags, we don't get anywhere near 82% correlation. So it really is the time integral of those properties that are correlating with the radiation belt. So that's an example of nonlinear correlations or nonlinear interactions in the system. So let's go to the next slide. The system, like all good complex systems, has feedback loops in it. And here's an example of some feedback loops. So starting at the left, we have the solar wind, which gets made into the magneto sheath. And then the magneto sheath uh, reconnects with the Earth's magnetosphere in the red oval there. And the magneto sheath's conditions to a large extent control the reconnection rate. So let's say we change the magneto sheath conditions such that the reconnection rate goes up strongly. Okay. So if the reconnection rate goes up strongly, magnetospheric convection will go up strongly. And then if we go up from, the, from that circle to the plasmaspheric drainage plume, when we strongly increase convection in the magnetosphere, that open closed boundary, which is the plasma pause, shrinks. And all the plasma spheric material that was stuck outside that new open closed boundary, instead of circulating, circ circulating around the Earth, is now heading for the dayside reconnection site. So you get a big surge of high density magnetospheric plasma mm -hmm. called the plasmaspheric drainage plume heading for the re dayside reconnection rate. And then when it hits that reconnection rate after about a two hour period of advection, it mass loads reconnection and it shuts down the reconnection rate. So the solar wind turns up reconnection and the magnetosphere fights back a couple of hours later and tries to shut it down. Now there's two other feedback loops here. So the day side reconnection rate, to the right of it, it increases magnetospheric convection. And to the right of that, convection causes other magnetospheric processes to ongo. And those lead to ionospheric outflows of oxygen, which is high density, high mass density. Some of it goes into the ion plasma sheet. Some of it goes into the warm plasma cloak. And those on open drift trajectories eventually make their way to the day side reconnection site and they mass load the reconnection rate. And so this feedback loop is really only seeable or important during geomagnetic storms, but basically it lowers the solar wind magnetosphere coupling during storms. Okay, next slide. Another property of complex systems is emergence. And that's sort of a concept where the system starts to make things that you don't expect. And I'll 
describe three examples of what might be emergence in the magnetosphere ionosphere system. The first is the spatial patterns of pulsating aurora. So if you think about how the diffuse aurora works, you have substorm injections of electrons, and as those electrons gradient curvature drift in the dipole, they make unstable distribution functions which drive chorus waves, and the chorus waves energize the radiation belt, but they also pitch angle scatter lower energy electrons, kilovolt, tens of kilovolt electrons into the atmosphere. And it turns out when that occurs, you very often get these spatial temporal patterns of blinking things all over the sky. And we really don't understand those patterns. I mean, from the, just a uh, space physics point of view, we know that the chorus waves are getting patchy and their intensity is going up and down in patches, but we don't really know why that occurs. <laughs> Sorry about that, that's my office mate. <laughs> so that's one example of emergence. A second example is uh, auroral arcs. So if you think about how magneto tail convection works and uh, current systems get set up and whatnot, it, it's very funny that very thin, intense current systems will form in the magneto tail that connect to the ionosphere and make auroral arcs. And you might say, well, that's not really an emergent thing. We've known about auroral arcs for centuries, but we still don't know how they work. Uh, it, that, that fact gives me the opportunity every 30 years to write a review article on how we don't understand the physics behind auroral arcs. A third example of emergence, which is very curious, is, is really the outer electron radiation belt. So if you, if, you thought of, if you thought about the system and how you get plasma sheet, plasma, and substorm injected electrons coming in and advection and whatnot, if you didn't know about the radiation belt, you probably wouldn't predict that there would be one. And this is a list of, this numbered list of things you need to get the radiation belt. The first four, just to get a radiation belt, you need a dipolar region that can trap the particles, and you need a repeatedly unstable magneto tail to pump it. You need energetic substorm injected electrons for a seed population. You need free energy in the electron plasma sheet to drive chorus waves, and you need energization via wave particle interactions from those chorus waves. And then to get the dynamics of the radiation belts, you further need ULF waves to redistribute the radiation belt, hiss inside the plasma sphere to scatter the radiation belt into the atmosphere and to get rid of the radiation belt when the geomagnetic activity goes low. You need ULF waves acting during magnetopause shadowing to rapidly dump the radiation belts at the beginning of storms. And you need emic waves in the plume to also rapidly dump the radiation belt at the beginning of the storm. So you could argue that the electron radiation belt is a form of emergent phenomena in this magnetospheric system. So let's move on to 13. So I want to talk about a system tool. And uh, so you might ask the question, is system science useful? Uh, you know, are we just wasting some of our space physics resources by thinking about system science and system tools and whatnot. And um, I think at, certainly at times it can be useful. And here's a useful tool. And this is one we've developed specifically for the solar wind driven magnetosphere and we call it vector vector correlation. So what we do is we wanna describe the magnetosphere with a magnetospheric state vector and that's vector M as a function of T. And that state vector, we're going to put in a bunch of different measures of the magnetosphere. And basically, any measure we can get our hands on. So we're going to put in a number of geomagnetic indices, which is KP, DST, AL, AU, PCI, MBI. And those measure convection strength, auroral activity strength, plasma pressure in the magnetosphere. And then we put in things like the number density of the ion plasma sheet, temperature of the ion plasma sheet, pressure of the ion plasma sheet to monitor the plasma sheet, a very important particle population. We put in things like the substorm injected electron flux, Fe130, and the electron radiation belt flux. And then the MPE and MPI are total ion precipitation power and total electron precipitation power into the ionosphere. We put in ULF indices, we put in the time since the last substorm. Basically, any measure 
we can have of the behavior of the system, we put in this magnetospheric state vector. And likewise, we have a solar wind state vector, and it contains the common measures of the solar wind you get from Omni, like the density of the solar wind, solar wind speed, field strength, IMF clock angle, Mach number, uh, delta V is the fluctuate, turbulence fluctuation amplitude in the solar wind, F10.7, and even I sprawl, the intensity of the electron sprawl. And so what we do is we look, we assume that the solar wind state vector drives the magnetospheric state vector, and we look for correlations in those vector properties. And the method gives us a lot of really nice things. It gives us universal solar wind driver functions that really describe how the solar wind drives the magnetosphere. It gives us collective modes of reaction of the magnetosphere to the solar wind. And we've seen three different modes that can be activated by the solar wind. And it gives us a really nice compact uh, description of the system and its driver. So let's go to the next slide and we'll see what we mean. So let's go to 14, please. Okay. So here's a plot of 102,000 hours of data. Each black data point is one hour of data. Vertically, we plot a canonical magnetospheric index, M canon, and horizontally, we plot the canonical solar wind driver function, S canon. Okay. And our vector-vector correlation techniques gave us formulas for these two scalar properties, the magnetospheric scalar from the magnetospheric vector and the solar wind scalar from the solar wind vector. Okay. So here we're plotting, in a sense, driver strength to the right and geomagnetic activity or magnetospheric activity towards the top. And in this data, the blue curve is a linear regression fit, and the red dots are 50-point running averages of the black points. And you can see the running averages tracks the linear regression pretty well, so we're getting a linear response in the description of the magnetosphere as a function of the solar wind driver. And in this case, the correlation of these data points is 92%. Now, for years, we've done these kind of a plots where we would plot vertically the AE index and horizontally VBZ or the Newell function or some driver function. And if we push those that kind of approach with this data, we would get correlations that we could beat 70%, but not by much. And here we're beating 90%. So this is a very powerful way of describing the behavior of the magnetosphere as driven by the solar wind. And it's robust. And here's what I mean by robust. So when we do this procedure, we can derive these quantities using only slow solar wind and test them using only fast solar wind, and we get ex excellent description of the fast solar wind. We can generate this process using solar minimum data and test it with only solar maximum data and it does an excellent job. And the remarkable one is we can generate this using only times when geomagnetic activity is low and test it only at times when geomagnetic activity is high and it does an excellent job of describing it. And that last thing indicate something for the future. So let's say we create this using all the solar wind data and all the magnetospheric data that, that we have seen in the past. And in the future, there's going to be some Carrington type solar wind or something that we haven't seen yet. We have a good chance of predicting what the magnetosphere will do, even though we haven't seen it do it yet. So for future space weather, this might be a really good descriptor of magnetospheric activity and the solar wind driving of that activity. And it's just merely, we just need to get used to describing things, storms, substorms and whatnot with this, ver this new magnetospheric variable. And then, you know, we're good to go. Okay, so I'm gonna start wrapping up here. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So we wrote down here a number of adjectives 
that appears to describe systems in the literature, you know, feedback, turbulent, interdependent, complex, emergent, adaptive, all these things. And I'm not going through these, but I'll just say that in that Borofsky and Valdivia surveys of geophysics paper, there's a paragraph or so on each of these adjectives and explaining how you would see this in the magnetosphere. And then you could check off each one of these descriptions fits the magnetosphere to some extent. Let's go to 16 slide. And this is a list of some outstanding system level questions. Okay. And there's, there's much more than this, but this is just an example of some. So what's the mechanism behind the sudden loss of the electron radiation belt? Number two, what are the impacts of the various cold ion and cold electron populations of the magnetosphere? We don't know those populations very well. They've been hard to measure. And so they're going to have impacts that we haven't quantified and that we don't know. Three, the pathways of plasma transport into the magnetosphere, low latitude boundary layer versus the cusp for the solar wind to get in, which is more important and when. Four, how does polar cap potential saturation work? There's a lot of uh, different ideas out in the literature. What causes the three hour periodicity of substorm recurrence is not really understood. People have some clues. Number six, what are the controlling factors for ionospheric outflows? That's very important for modeling the magnetosphere to get all that stuff right. And then seven uh, is a system science, system science question. How do we integrate the solar wind driven magnetosphere into the broader earth system science? And earth system science is a really big field. It talks about the oceans, the atmosphere, uh, pollution, man's activity and whatnot. And on point number seven, the pathway to do that might be looking at particle precipitation in the atmosphere, auroral precipitation, radiation belt precipitation, and solar energetic particle precipitation in the atmosphere. And those particles affect atmospheric chemistry, which affects atmospheric cooling, and they affect atmospheric electricity, which may affect weather systems. So the pathway to get Magnetospheric system science into Earth system science may be uh, precipitation. Okay, please 17. Recommended papers. Um, so the four papers at the top are not really system science papers, they're more magnetospheric tutorials, and these are ones that I really like. Uh, some are really short, some are much longer. And then I don't think there's very many papers on the system science of the magnetosphere that actually talk about system properties. Most of the papers that talk about system science and magnetosphere talk about applications of mathematical techniques to like search for chaos or you know search for dimensionality of the system and whatnot. And there's a number of papers listed for the data analysis methods that, that are based on trying to get particular properties of the system from data sets, usually the AE index. Okay. So finally, the last slide. Juan and I'd like to thank you for listening to this talk and I hope you all stay well. And these are the collaborators and support uh, programs that helped us out. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Joe, we got a lot of questions and all of them are good. So I'd like to go through them. Uh, Kyle and I have just discussed with 300 people, we can't actually find and unmute people in a timely manner. So I'm going to read the questions to you. And if the person asking the question doesn't think I got the question right, they can put it in the in the uh, in the chat box and and rephrase it. We'll we'll get back to it. So uh, let's see here. Your first question was from Richard Denton. Let me find that. And Richard asked. Why is it that the electrons get proportionally more energy when injected from the plasma sheet? I don't know that that's true. I think Joachim Biren has done a number of magneto tail collapse simulations and looked at particle populations in the tail and then particle populations at geosynchronous. And I think the answer is almost always that the particle Particles are accelerated adiabatically. The, the cooler part of the population and the superthermal tail, it's almost all adiabatic acceleration. Now, there might be a little demagnetization acceleration of 
ions. But, but I think Yakum's the person to ask about that. But I would guess it's all adiabatic to, to a large extent. And that way it wouldn't favor ions or electrons as long as they get carried in. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. Yeah. Can't okay. guess. Uh, could you go to slide five, please? Uh, can I say it was just that uh, on your chart of the different populations, it showed the electrons going up farther. That's why I asked. And I wonder if it's because. Oh, the, in the light blue box and the red box. Yeah. Uh, right? yeah. I, that, may, that may be just what parameters I got to where I put those box limits. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Your next question is from Vanya Jordanova on slide five. She'd like to know where the ring current fits in on this picture. I believe the ring current is the ion plasma sheet. Okay. And now, when you go closer to the dipole here, that can go up further in energy. So this is more the ion plasma sheet, more like geosynchronous and outward. But I, I never distinguish between those populations because, you know, when, once it gets caught and trapped, then you start to call it the ring current, but it's, it's the diamagnetism of the ion plasma sheet population. Okay. Your next question is... Yeah, because... Oh, yeah, go may ahead. May I ask? Please. Uh, because you have a specific, you know, plasma sphere and radiation belt, uh -huh. and I think the ring current population is uh, distinct from those not only in energy but also in the physics. Yeah, well, the, yes, it is the, the, yeah, yeah. I, I would believe that, but certainly the partial ring current, which really is the ion plasma sheet, flows right through the plasma sphere and into the geocorona, in fact, and you know, suffers charge exchange. Okay. Okay. Okay, next question is from Soliman Mohammed. And he would like a few words about the relationship of substorms, storms, and CMEs. Well, okay, so um, a storm is a extended period of strong driving of the magnetosphere. Um, during a storm, since you're you're driving and driving results, even modest driving results in substorms, the storm level of driving will give you a lot of substorms if you can identify them. If you drive really hard, it's hard to identify individual substorms anymore because things like the left side of the tail goes off and then the right side of the tail goes off. And it can be pretty messy in terms of identifying individual substorms. And then a CME, a coronal mass ejection from the sun, is often a very good driver of storms. Uh, it has it can have a very strong magnetic field, it can have a high speed, it can have a good field orientation for causing a lot of dayside reconnection. Uh, storms can also be driven by other things, uh, usually not as intense as a CME though. Okay, thank you. Howard Singer may be on the telephone with a question. Can we hear Howard? I cannot hear Howard, but I hope someone will attempt to get him in. We'll move on. Uh, Colin Comer would like you to go to page 10. Thanks for running the slides. That really saves me a lot of thinking. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, he's interested in what you can tell him about the frequencies of these waves. Oh, I, I don't know. Well, the chorus uh, wave intensities, they're, they're kind of electron cyclotron type periods. Uh, is that? I, I think that's what he's asking, and just maybe, maybe just physically, what frequency? Several yeah, kilohertz. Uh, chorus waves are related to the electron cyclotron frequency, and emic uh, live below the live, live around the ion cyclotron periods between oxygen cyclotron and proton cyclotron and whatnot. I, I'm not an expert on those frequencies, but, but we, I, we might we I might expect emic to be about like, half a half a second, and yeah. chorus would be. Several thousand kilohertz. kilohertz, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to clarify, my question was more about, um, since these waves actually have a, a, a broad range of frequencies, aren't these integrals uh, frequency dependent? 
Well, if you were to integrate the wave powers themselves, you would have to look at the wave power in the band that you really think affects the flux of the radiation belt. I'm looking more at the strength of the drivers of those waves. So I, I guess I, I can weasel out of that complicated integral since I'm looking at the cause of the waves, the correlations of the reaction of something with the cause of those waves. Okay, Colin. Dave, this is Howard. Can you hear me now? Now I can. Yep. Great. Thank you. So, Joe, great talk. I, I really mm -hmm. like your approach and, and how you visualize things and look at the different uh, drivers and responses. Uh, but I have a question about slide 14, mm -hmm. where you showed the high correlation between the magnetic yeah. activity, magnetospheric activity index, and canonical solar wind driver. Right. And if part of the reason for that correlation is, is that you include so many different things in the magnetospheric index. So if it isn't right. energy or something going into one type of process that's right. encompassed by that index, it's going into right. somewhere else. And yeah. so I'm sort of wondering how this would really be useful because we don't know from this sort of view of processes as to whether things are going into one region or another region uh, or one process or another. Right, but we, we have the same problem. If we were to gauge storms by the KP index, then we would know what the convection level is in the magnetosphere from that index, but we wouldn't know anything about radiation belts or substorms or anything. And likewise, if we gauge a storm strength or gauge space weather by only the DST index, then we know about the pressure uh, of the plasma in the inner magnetosphere, but we don't know anything about, you know, auroral levels or we always have that problem. Uh, here, this is akin to using a stock market index rather than one stock to gauge uh, activity of the of the economy or something. And even and I guess what I would say is is that useful in in space weather often is knowing that individual response as well. You can still get that. I mean, if you use this as a gauge of the storm or of a, of a predictor of activity, you can still get the DST index. You can still get the KP index. You can still get AE. It's like we're not saying don't look at those anymore. Um, we're just saying that here's a, a different tool that has some real advantages. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, good. Now, Patri has a question about slide 11. you say a few words about where and when ionospheric outflow occurs? Oh, well, okay. Um, it occurs all over the place. Uh, it occurs in the auroral zone on closed field, closed open, open drift trajectory field lines. Uh, it occurs on the cusp and off the polar cap where stuff lands out in the tail and gets advected up into the dipolar regions. Uh, for the ion plasma sheet and the cloak, uh, questions are how much comes from the auroral zone, how much comes from the polar cap cusp to contribute to those. The plasmospheric drainage plume uh, is also ionospheric. Uh, it, it, I mean, the plasma is also ionospheric outflow that occurs on the sunlit uh, ionosphere. There's a photoelectron driven kind of an outgassing and that builds up as a cold plasma. So it occurs all over the place. It's often hard to trace back. I mean, you see a particle population in the dipole magnetosphere it's of oxygen, let's say, and it's really hard to figure out where that actually came from. I, I'm, I like to push the auroral zone as an outflow place because we don't see it when we look at geosynchronous orbit in the plasma sheet at the edge of the, you know, outer edge of the dipole, we don't see much cold plasma back there. So I, I think, the, I think the auroral zone is an important ionospheric outflow place, although uh, a lot of people will argue with me on that, and so. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Brandon Burkholder would like to know if there's ever times when there's geomagnetic activity without any significant solar wind driver. 
Well, you know, we have uh, a concept we call the viscous interaction. That's like the two big drivers are supposed to be the reconnection driver and the viscous interaction driver. We don't know much about the viscous interaction, about the physics of it. Uh, but basically, when you shut off reconnection by making the solar wind conditions for reconnection very poor, you still see a residual geomagnetic activity like in the AE index of 100, 150 nanoteslas. And people would argue that that is the viscous interaction. Now, it's too weak to give you substorms or anything major, but there still is a little bit of convection, and the magnetosphere is doing some slow evolution at those times. Uh, so, yes, we can have, I think, without strong day side reconnection, we can have mild activity. Okay, thank you. Could you go to slide 14? Maria Wallach is curious to know. On down to what time scale you could take this down? Is this for hours average? Could you go down to shorter time periods than hours and get a We problem? can. Yeah, we can go to shorter, but we have not because we like using solar cycles with the data. And a lot of the indices are, you know, that we've been using are uh, available at the hour. One of the key one is KP, and that's actually a three hour average that goes in here. But okay. uh, Potsdam is making a 30 minute KP now. And if I read her question correctly, she's curious to know whether you think you'll see something different if you do that, or you just don't know. Well, if we go down to short time resolution, I'm sure we'll see some differences. Now, one thing you have to remember is we don't have good solar wind at short time scales. Mm -hmm. uh, we have solar wind measured at L1, and when you add VEC that to the Earth and you make a one minute solar wind out of it, it doesn't really look like the measurements at the Earth. So. Oh, Five minute solar wind is maybe the limit, but 15 minutes may be a better yeah. thing to think about. I second that. Richard Denton, do you still have questions about slide 14? Um, yes, I just um, wondered what the meaning of S canon and M canon are. Uh, are they some kind of uh, abstract state vector or what, what no. are they? So uh, your state vector has a number of variables in it, and the vertical M canon is a linear combination of those variables, and the horizontal S canon is a linear combination of the solar wind variables in the solar wind state vector, and that linear combination formula does not change with time. It's one formula to go from that set of variables to that to those, no, those uh, scalar numbers. Okay, Richard. So these, are, so these are just chosen to maximize the correlation, this right. um, whatever Math combination it is? Mathematically chosen to maximize the correlation between the two. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, staying on this slide, Zubair Scheich is curious, the canonical solar wind driver, do you include both quiet time cases and disturbed conditions? Uh, well, in this plot, this is all, this was made from all the data that we have, uh, which is disturbed times, quiet times and whatnot. Now we've done tests where we only take part of the data to make the formulas and then test it on other parts of the data. Uh, but this one is made with all data. But if you get about the same answer and about the same correlation, if you just use a small subset of the data, and as I say, even a subset that like restricts you to slow solar wind or restricts you to low geomagnetic activity, you still get pretty much the same answer with the same correlations. Okay, a lot of people have questions, are very interested in this slide. Martin Archer asks, does the canonical solar wind correlation also have these time integrations built in, like you described with the radiation belt fluxes. And what do the time scales and coefficients tell us about the physics? Uh, no, there, in fact, uh, there's not even time lags in here between the solar wind and the magnetosphere. Uh, this is no time integrations and no time lags. Okay. Uh, we've, we've done this with time lags, uh, adding variable time lags and optimizing the time lags with these evolutionary algorithms, and it improves things by maybe one percentage point. Uh, it's remarkably, we don't need lags to, 
do this thing. Uh, and um, but we know the real system has variable lags all over the place. Okay. Staying on this slide, Katie Koning asks: Given all the parameters hiding in M canonical, can you really explain what the magnetosphere will do in response to the future Carrington solar wind event? Well, I can describe what M canon will be for that event. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, Andrew Dimmock is. Oh, did I skip one? Wait one second. Yep, I did. Please go. Ooh, I skipped Lenny. We're going to hear from Dolores Knipp, who is curious to know if we have sufficient 1989 solar wind data from reconstruction to test the assertion that we can hindcast that event with the two state vectors approach. Um, I am trying to remember. Um, we don't have data for 1987, but I think we have a little bit for 1989 event. So it's a maybe. And yeah, and I just wrote a gem proposal that talked about that in there, but I uh, can't remember what I said. Okay, very good. Nithin Savadas asks on slide 15, what is the reason for the general generalizability of the canonical correlation analysis you described? Example, why does it do a good job predicting the system states during high magnetic activity while you have developed it only for low magnetic activity? I think the answer is, is it's finding kind of a universal driving of the system where, it, where that driving doesn't change if it's weak driving versus strong driving. Now, if, if we just look at a single index, we tend to see this polar cap potential saturation. And there we would argue that the driving at low activity and the driving at high activity are very different because this big bended curve. And here we have a straight curve. So we're finding some description of the driving of the system that's universal, that's independent of how strong the driving is, independent of the wind speed and whatnot. It's picking up something powerful. Okay, very it's, good. It's a real surprise that it did it, but it's very pleasing. Mm -hmm. We've got a few more here, not too many more. Andrew Dimmock asks, on slides 13 and 14, he notes that auroral indices such as AL use fixed stations, but the geomagnetic activity has a latitudinal dependency which is not always captured by AL. Does this have an effect when you include them in system science approaches like this? Um, yeah, the answer must be yes, uh, but when you do this, uh, canonical approach, it picks out what it wants out of your state vector. So if there's some effect that's like ruining things, it'll probably give a very low coefficient to that variable in the state vector. So it, the system mathematically can get rid of adverse effects or effects that don't have good descriptions. Okay, next question is from Sergio Toledo Redondo. Can you comment on what would be the best time lag between solar wind vector and magnetosphere vector? Did you consider a zero lag time for the 0.92 correlation you showed? Yes, this is zero lag time. And when we uh, allow optimized individual lags of the different indices from the solar wind, we tend to come up with about a one hour lag. Depends on the index. Like the polar cap index has only a few minute lag if you look at that because it's a it's a almost immediate reaction to the solar wind and if you look at the AE index we tend to have a fraction of an hour lag if you look at DST it tends to have a several hour lag because it has to plasma has to get through the system to make that so depending on the physics of that index the lags tend to be different okay now we have two questions that we're actually going to address in much greater detail further on in this series but if you'd like to comment on them, you could now, or you can say that'll be covered in future. The next question is from Boris Petrovich. What, uh, what is the nature of moon magnetosphere interactions or vice versa? Is that relevant to this topic? Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, we always thought when I was doing auroral physics, we would like to see the shadow of the moon in the, you know, where you're absorbing particles from the plasma sheet. And, is there an auroral perturbation from the mm -hmm. flux tubes that are being swept around the moon and emptied? Um, I, I don't know the answer how strong it is, but I, one could certainly do correlations that include the moon going through the plasma sheet mm -hmm. uh, when you do 
so that we make these for correlations and to see if there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Curious. Okay, the next one is also one which we're definitely going to go into much greater detail further in this series. But the question is, what is a good definition for a substorm? And how do you recognize a substorm in ground magnetometers at, mid, at high and mid-latitudes? <clears throat> well, my favorite way to spot substorms is with the geosynchronous particle injection events. Uh, you tend not to get small events. They tend to, if you look at a plot of event size versus number of events, there's a kind of a fall off uh, that you can still see that, you can still measure that. So they tend to come pretty strong. And so you don't get fooled by an like, infinite amount of small events. So I like geosynchronous ion and electron injections to count substorms to, or, mm -hmm. to, or to find a substorm onset. Um, we've done stuff with the, with the um, not the AE index, but the, uh, the big AE index, the big AL index, super mag indices, mm -hmm. uh, to do ground ones. And then we've compared those with geosynchronous and yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's trickier with ground magnetometers, I think, than it is with space-based measurements. Okay. Uh, the next one, if I interpret it correctly, is one about a reverse effect because it asks, do you see the possibility of storm, by which I believe it means weather system storm, influencing in, in electric fields, having some effect back up in the magnetosphere? Well, you know, people talk about uh, thunderstorm generated whistlers, mm -hmm. and people have talked about thunderstorm electric fields uh, being related to microbursts also, I think. Um, but it, it's possible, and yeah, and if you went in the literature, yeah, I'm sure you'd find some connections that people have explored. Okay, we've got just two more. Uh, this is Zubir Shaikh again, and he's curious to know exactly what happens to radiation belt electrons when a CME strikes the magnetosphere. Well, if you get um, a sudden change in the pressure of the solar, the ram pressure of the solar wind, which you tend to when the shock sheath hits you, you get a high density, fast uh, plasma coming. <clears throat> you tend to get a sudden loss of electron radiation belt particles. Uh, the two mechanisms that people argue are active is the magnetopause gets pushed in and ULF wave activity goes up and electrons radially diffuse to the magnetopause. And the second is that high density solar wind leads to a super dense plasma sheet in the Earth's magnetosphere, which is a very strong driver of emic waves, and you get pitch angle diffusion into the atmospheric loss cone. The curious thing is, is that when you see MeV electrons drop out, you do not see MeV ions drop out. And if it was magnetopause shadowing in ULF radial diffusion, an MeV ion and an MeV electron should behave the same. You should get a drop out of both but you don't see any drop out of the protons. Interesting. So that makes emic, uh, points a finger at emic. Okay, got it. Uh, the last point is a comment from Pat Reif, if she has the microphone, a brief comment about um, viscous interaction. Would you like to say it yourself, Pat? Well, I would just, you were, you were pointing out uh, that, that there's still a background uh, convection, even with, with merging turned off. and. And it's really exciting. We've seen some of the reconnection inside Kelvin Helmholtz waves at the boundary now with MMS. And I think we're really seeing that, that driver in glorious detail. <laughs> now, in a, now, there's also an argument that some people have made that you get reconnection uh, past the cusp that still drives a little activity when you don't get day side reconnection. When you turn that off, you might turn on reconnection beyond the cusps, besides the Kelvin Helmholtz reconnection. So some yeah. of that residual might be caused by still reconnection. Oh, we, we certainly see reverse reconnection behind the cusp as well. And there's been plenty of times when we see really strong solar uh, ionospheric flow poleward, uh, you know, and that was, that was controversial a while back, but I don't think it's controversial anymore. <laughs> right. Okay, that brings us to an end. We're way over time. As you can see, the talk was A, fantastic, and B, 
attracted a lot of very interesting questions from a large number of people. So I'd like to thank you, Joe. This was a superb introduction to our seminar series. Oh, thanks you all and stay safe, everyone. Really good, we want everybody to be safe. Everybody stay safe. We will be back here one week from now with a presentation on the solar wind input, the first step in the chain of solar wind magnetosphere interaction. That talk will be given at 1600 UT next Monday by Lynn Wilson, who works at Goddard Space Flight Center. Thank you to everybody. Thank you especially to Joe. Thank you to all the people who paid attention and asked really interesting, actually very interesting questions. Thanks everybody. We'll see you in a week. Bye-bye.